ETM host at Rennie Sean. Welcome in peace. My name is Sean. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into the show today. Uh, like the show, share the show, tell a friend, tell a friend. Um, if you're not live and you will come back and review this later, you know, we appreciate you for tuning in. Uh, let me uh, give me a second, ladies and gentlemen. I need to switch some real quick. I want to apologize for the troll that's in the chat already as the button just got pressed and he, he said it's a ghost town. <laughs> All right, bear with me a second. And that's done. Okay. Good boy, man. You're here to learn. Not everybody's here to learn. Some people they don't they don't want to learn. It says you here to learn. You share the you share the show on your on your platform. You share the show, and uh, you invite your friends. All your friends. That's what you do. Get your pen and piece of paper out if you're here to learn. Appreciate that. All right, so we actually getting started a little late. Nobody was expecting me to actually hit the button. I'm pretty sure you guys are all enjoying quarantine or some conspiracy show that's going on right now. However, uh, if you are re-watching this, it's not gonna be a long presentation. It's actually gonna be something a little specific. As you can see, uh, the Yaka people is the subject of conversation. How many people are familiar with the Yaka? Anybody in the chat? It's a small delay, so I'll wait. Okay. Yeah, I might see something for me in this presentation. Uh, that you wouldn't think it would be associated with them. What y'all quarantine faces look like, man? Y'all barber still working? All right, so I'm going to get started in just a minute. I'm actually trying to share the show, so... If you don't hear me saying anything, it's pretty much why. I got to do it an unorthodox way because uh, YouTube 
I mean, no, not YouTube, but Facebook. Facebook got me in jail for like till June. I can't share nothing to June. All right, I don't know if uh, Kofi will be joining. If so, he'll probably do his thing whenever he do his thing. All right, so. That's weird. Oh, okay, okay. What else to tell? Hmm. <laughs> Do you want to fact check me, Jeremiah? <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, man. Again, man. ETM Hotel, Rennie Sean. Welcome to Peace. My name is Sean. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into the show today. Um, <laughs> we appreciate the commentary by, by Jeremiah in the chat. <laughs> he said he come in peace. Uh, we glad you subscribed to the channel, brother. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, like the show, share the show. Tell a friend, tell a friend. It's going down, man. Uh, we're going to talk about the Yaka people today. Who are the Yaka? Where they come from? And uh, let's see if there's anything for me that we can uh, resurrect out of the Yaka. So today's outline looks like this. We'll have my hypothesis who are the Yaka, where did they migrate from, the Yaka exodus, Yaka encounters the Portuguese, the culture, traditions, and customs, and the conclusion. Yep, the Yaka encountered the Portuguese too. The Yaka people seem to carry the same traditions and customs we see in West and East Africa. Before the Portuguese arrived and the acceptance of Christianity culturally, the Yaka embodied African spirit. Through song, dance, rituals, and work, the people would devise a, a culture worth understanding. The Yaka seemed to be a subgroup of another tribe among the Congo who must have fled into the area they now reside due to some type of war or forced migration. I think the emergence of Christianity was eliminated some of the cultural practices, but some traditions still exist to this day. The Yaka are an African ethnic group found in southwestern Dominican Republic of Congo with Angola border to their west. 
They number about 300,000 are related to the Suku people. They live in the forest in the savannah region between the Quango River and the Wambao River. Yaka is also the surname that is used in South Africa and Swaziland, including its clan name called the Lungi. If you look at the map, if you can see it, okay, shows you exactly where they reveal. The Yaka people inhabiting the wooded plateau in the savannah areas between the Kwango and the Wambay rivers in southwestern Congo, Kinshasa, directly bordering Angola on the west. Their origins are not certain, and the Yaka is now an ethnic name given to the people of several heritages, including those related to the nearby Suku. Rural Yaka are subsistence farmers of casanova and corn or maize as staple crops. Their diet is supplemented when possible by hunting or fishing. Most Yaka men see work in Kinshasa or other urban centers, and many engage in trade in the, in the greater Congo area. Yaka material culture carving, basketry, metal work, and weaving is well known. Yaka masks and figures have distinctive bulky forms, global eyes, uh, and turn up noses. Some are polychrome and many have raffia cloth or fringes attached. Yaka style dominates the expressive forms of neighboring groups. A closer look if you couldn't see it on the previous map. As you can see, Angola, Central African Republic, the Congo areas, Dominican Republic of Congo, Yaka homeland, you see it highlighted in that gray area. That will be considered the, the land for them. Their oral tradition states that they migrated northwest into the current location from the Lunde Plateau region in the 16th century. The verb kuyaka, the noun bayaka, derives Congo to catch flying objects. The bayaka were, the, were those Congo people said, bawu bayaka mbele bayaka mpuza, translation, they catch the uh, cutlasses that the enemies throw at them. They catch the arrows flying, a term used initially to describe them. The colonial Portuguese called them jagas, and their name may be derived from the Congo verb yaka, which means grab, take, or hold, referring to the invaders of the kingdom of the Congo. In the 17th century and onwards, the Portuguese used the word jagas, English word yakas, to refer to any rootless and uh, vagabond peoples, even if peaceful in their colonies. Here's an image of the Yaka mask. You may have seen these in several presentations, but you didn't necessarily catch wind to what a Yaka mask was. I actually did a little brief synopsis on the Yaka mask a while back, maybe a month and a half, two months ago. Among the Yaka, the males contribute to the local economy largely through hunting. They may hunt either individually or in groups and most often use bow and arrow or old rifles. Hunting dogs are a prized possession among the Yaka and their ability to sniff out the game is compared to the Mganga's ability to sniff out witches. These women contribute most of the food primarily through cultivation of ca cassava, sweet potatoes, beans, and peanuts. They further supplement the diet through the gathering of wild fruits and berries and occasional fishing. Here's an image of the Yaka, the top and the bottom. See the dancing Yaka boys. They're getting it in. Now, the Yaka follow matrilineal descendant patterns, which are overlaid with a reckoning of uh, patrilineal ascent, family name, and land ownership. Each community has a local chief who is the direct descendant of the original landowner and usually is controlled to some extent by a paramount regional chief. The Congolese government official governs each region in conjunction with the local chiefs, controlling the extent of the power of those individual chiefs. Ritual specialists and diviners who achieve their prominence through display of their individual healing powers also inform political decisions. Here's some more current Yaka boys. As you can see, all of these shirts are on top of the, uh, the roof or the hook. 
something that they actually built themselves. See how they're standing, right? Bossed up. King Kasango led the exodus of the Lunda westward around the 17th century, the most organized expedition towards the conquest of the Kwango region in the Kingdom of Congo. Some Lunda had already preceded this. These Lunda conquerors were endowed with three major qualities, diplomacy, sociability, and the organization, uh, which enabled them to found the Yaka Kingdom in the 17th century harmoniously integrating the pre-established Congo nations. The Lunda used this soft power more than fighting to favor the union of the two peoples, Lunda and Congo, under the kingdom, uh, under the kingdom Yaka. Now, ethnologists and sociologists unanimously agreed that throughout the Belgian colonial history, this kingdom was one of the best organized and especially the most resistant to Western penetration. I'm gonna run that last one back, all right? Ethnologists and sociologists unanimously agree that throughout Belgian colonial history, this kingdom, the Yaka kingdom, was one of the best organized and especially the most resistant to Western penetration. The name Yaka is a, a title that the Congo gave to their warriors. Upon the arrival of Lunda, the kingdom of Congo was already weakened by the Portuguese incursions. Thus, the resistance that the Lunda find in the Congo region is that of the isolated local tribe Congo, including the Mbala, Tsamba, Hungana, Pindi, and Gogo, rather than that of the United Congo Kingdom. The Lunda, these Biliwa or foreigners is what they called them, which nothing resisted on their passes capable of catching bullets and arrows were also called Iluwa, foreigners or Bayaka, catchers of the balls and the, the, yeah, the balls and arrows. Both the Lunda that arrived and the Congo warriors had similar traits, hence the exact titles being given to them. The Lunda who had an interest in integrating into a political organization, the local tribes who had not fled the invasion or who did not want to fight had in turn adopted the identity Yaka, which in addition to conferring on them a, a title of nobility of the invincible integrated them better in their new country. They had also gradually adopted the Congo language, hence the Kiyaka language being spoken among them an offshoot of Kikongo. Much more alone, the chiefs married uh, Congo women. The offspring identified themselves as Yaka rather than Lunda. Thus the Yaka appellation had established itself as a generic identity of the Lunda and the Congo inhabiting territories, uh, territorial area under the authority of the Kayemu Kasango Lunda, namely the territories of Kasango Lunda, Kenge and uh, Papa Kubaka. <laughs> I butchered that one. The Lunda of Insofu in later came in the territory of Kiambe retained the Lunda identity and language. As uh, for the territory of Feshi, they immigrated there in the middle of the 18th century from the Basuku, a group uh, which is a group of Congo who disassociated themselves from the power of the Kiamu Kasango Lunda and whose leader Mini Congo refused to submit to the authority of the latter. Some other Congo groups, the Mbala, Tsamba, Ugana, Pendi, and Ngogo, etc., had already immigrated to the uh, Kiwelu, uh, leaving behind them brothers and sisters who, together with the Lunde, composed the Yaka Kingdom. The five territories that make up the Congo are therefore a binational space, Congo and Lundu. Lunda. Now, the reconciliation is thus the end of the wars of the conquest between Congo ethnic groups and the Lunda and Congo was sealed by a ceremony and particularly a ceremony in which the chief mini Congo representing of the original Tsambe clans of Feshi and the Lunda chiefs were to share the parrot, dog and cat raw meat. At the end of the ceremony, the representatives of two nations buried their war weapons and promised peacefully coexistence forever. The Congo and the Lunda of the Congo have lived in perfect harmony since the beginning of the 19th century. 
By the year 1890, a skilled administrator named Donis came to negotiate his acceptance with the King Kwanwu to Simba in Kumbi. It was not even with his replacement of the name of Desart who sought to impose the Leopold administration on Kwango even by force. It was then that in 1892 and 1893, there were two wars ranked between the two armies, that of the Kwambu to Sim in Kumbi and that of the Leopoldian administration in which there were considerable losses on both sides. If the principal Belgium agent perished in the first war of 1892, the one which followed in 1893, with the greater reinforcement of soldiers of the political force, saw the assassination of the Kaimu to Simbi in Kumbu. In Kumbi. It was also the beginning of the destabilization of the kings, but not that of the kingdom of the resistance. In fact, the kings who were un, uh, enthroned after this revolting event showed themselves more intransigent with respect to submission to the power of whites. Thus faced with repression, they had the choice either to go into exile with their brothers, the Lunda of Angola, or undergo forced relegations to Benin, Beninville or elsewhere. Malombo kings, Desir in Kulu, and Chief uh, Mununi in Kizi were deported respectively, while the uh, Kiamu, Ma, uh, Muana, Koko, Kodia, Puanga found refuge in Angola in 1915. Peep this. After the two bloody wars of 1892 and 1893, when the Kwangu was militarily armed, the resistance assumed passive form. This took many forms, ranging from the subtle violence by Leopard men, Masiana, to civil disobedience and the refusal to serve any power of oppression, to participate in any enterprise or to obey any colonial injunction. It was this passive resistance that uh, continued throughout the colonial area until independence. When in 1908, Leopold II ceded to Congo to Belgium, the colonial administration to whom the narrative of the resistance Yaka had already been made, tried to occupy the Congo by force, but she stumbled upon the civil resistance whose main manifestation was the refusal of cooperation with the colonial agents. Even after the assassination in 1893 of the Kianu, Tsemba, and Kumbi, under which open resistance was waged, the Bayaka continued civic resistance. They leader died, they kept fighting. Because of the unfortunate incidents of the conflict after two years of colonial military siege, the colonial mission in Kwango was abandoned by the way of punishment and fear. That the Kwango hindered the colonial work and wished to overthrow the sovereignty of the Congo in the hands of colonial administration, which in turn forced administration to put the Kwango on hold which meant that no development pro uh, project could be undertaken. Now, this did not prevent the Bayaka associ uh, associating themselves with the nationalist message of Lumumba. Due to their strong presence in Kishasa, only a century later, they heavily participated in the movement in, in, of independence, especially as the party that brought them together. Luka, the Congolese uh, Union of Freedom and Independence, which had its own main objective in the independence. The Biyaka, by their strong mobilization in Kinshasa, contributed strongly to the events that precipitated the independence of Congo in 1959 and 1960. Now, if the Biyaka have a history so glorious, where's the disparagement they have subjected to? The denigration of the Biyaka was originally the work of the colonial agents. The latter, after having abandoned the Kwangu, were to create division to better establish their authority in the neighboring Bas Congo of Quilu. Afterwards, they began spreading propaganda about the Biyaka, claiming them to be the warriors and savages as they did not accept Western civilization. This became a means of dividing and reigning. This is how from the uh, machine, machinations of Colin colonialist stereotypes stick to the identity of Yaka, especially in Kinshasa, the capital where all the tribes of the Congo eventually met. Nevertheless, as it can be seen in the writings of sociologists and Belgium ethnologists, the colonial administration recognized the organization and dynamism of the Bayaka, as well as slanderous statements are made away from Kwangu and or whispering the Bayaka have uh, inter interturbably 
pursued their traditional activities in all areas, art, craftsmanship, construction, hunting, fishing, and agriculture. Now the Bayaka fell victim to their exceptional resistance to colonial oppression and exploitation. Those of the Kwango have among other things resisted fiercely efforts of participa uh, pacification, sorry, of the forced plague of the Leopold II administration. Now the Yaka are a matrilineal society that includes patrilineal lineages as family name. Their villages have chiefs who are, are rec recognized by the Congo government as a political office. Their traditional religion has the concept of Indasambai Yongu or a creator, creator God who resides in the sky but this creator is not a part of their celebrations or rituals. The religious practice of ceremonies are instead directed toward the Bambuta or the spirits of the ancestors. And these are also part of healing dances during illnesses. Their traditional religion has the concept of Nzambo Yafgu or the creator God who resides in the sky, but the uh, creator is not a part of, like I said, their celebrations or rituals. Now, understand this, the Yaka farm, uh, oops, excuse me, dang, let me go back. There's something that I want y'all to understand here, I ain't gonna read this whole slide. The, the Yaka, notably, like I said, they make the mask, the tools, and they do all of these things. Now, what I did in the last two slides was give you multiple sources, but they were all saying the same thing coming from different directions. They are steadfast in actually telling you exactly what the Yaka are. These people are still there today, but they still hold true to their traditional religions, even though with the heavy presence of Christianity and the coming of Leopold and the political struggles that they had over a time, they have still cling to and held on to traditional ways. So I'm not gonna go back over that. It's just a, a repeat from a different source saying the same thing. Here's again, the, uh, the actual Yaka doing their ritualistic dances. All right, so let's get into some initiation matters. This is what makes the Yaka so cool and worth studying. Uh, the Kaluku is initiation mask. It's a mask of the uh, Kakungi type and all, uh, are always kept in secret seclusion outside the village area. The Kakungu, a male version of the mask, is always accompanied by the female Kasiba, and both are worn by the ritual expert and his aide. These masks are of great importance to the Mukanda, and their carving is entrusted to the best sculptor in the area. They are usually painted dark red and brown. The Kakungu are usually very large. They commonly have a high forehead and gigantic drooping cheeks. The mask represents power and is called upon to bring about healing or to assure fertility, excuse me, and prosperity to the newly initiated. This is uh, Mahundu Maluku with her divination drum. Y'all see a drum in her hand look familiar to you. <laughs> The Kaluku, again, this is, uh, again, another version of initiation mask. Within this setting, the mask provides protection to the young initiate in his transition to adulthood by shielding him with possible dangers in his life. These dangers include initial contacts with women, in which case they also serve to protect the future fertility of the initiated individual. Sexuality seems to play an important role in the function of these types of masks. Kuluku masks frequently have a multi-layered construction above which rest small figures. These images encourage sexuality and procreation in human and animal models. In the case of animal models, they play no specific role on their own, but become objects of explicit sexual meaning when the dancers sing verses that explain them. Batik Yaka figures for the treatment of a hereditary curse. You see them right outside the little hood? That's what they are. They go to Yaka boys again. The newly circumcised remain naked in the open. 
So after their ritual, you know, after their uh, rites of passage, you know, they remain naked after they go through, do their thing. <laughs> Saw in the building. All right, now Yaka masks make their appearance only during the lengthy initiation ceremonies that are performed for boys. The initiation in Kanda prepares them from the social adulthood and is designed to safeguard the continuity of human fertility. The young men return to the village at the end of initiation period and perform mass dances. They are accompanied by the men who have uh, supervised them during their period, whom are also wearing masks. It is thought that the smaller masks worn by the new initiates are made by the young men themselves, whereas the masks worn by the leaders are made by the professional sculptors. Yaka masks are notable for their uh, polychromy. They uh, recapitulate all the constituent features that make up the universe, i.e. heavenly bodies, plants, animals, humans, spirits. The Yaka's chief prestige uh, stool uh, the Congo River area southeast of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the home of a highly artistic Yaka people. Like I told you earlier in the presentation, these are highly artistic people. They believe in the creator who inhabits the sky and is responsible for life, death, and unanswerable questions. There are no religious practices that actively pay homage to this God. Instead, religious celebrations focus on honoring the elders and the ancestors, like I said earlier. And the divination is a prime of importance for the Yaka. And the powers of medicine persons are measured by the ability to discern the cause of the illness. The arts of the Yaka number, numbering about 300,000 are very much alive today. The Yaka give aesthetic touch to almost all, all everyday objects. The chief stools supported by all women figure are intended for different ceremonies dedicated to honor the elders and the ancestors. As you can see in the stools, it's got breasts, it's a woman holding a bowl above her head. Now the Yaka, Suku, and Pindi circumcision mask. Now these masks are worn primarily in the context of the circumcision ritual, an important institution known in the actual zone as in Kanda, Mukanda, or in Zolongo. Now young boys are circumcised and taken to a bush camp where for several months they are initiated into their adult uh, status. Now Yaka masks represent founder ancestors and their main function is to ensure uh, I don't know how to say that word. Now the Himba mask, particularly the great Kakungu, are worn by important initiates who haunt the circumcision camp, frightening women and children away. Other masks such as the Ndimbi and the uh, Tesikidai may be worn by the newly circumcised during the dances that are held after the camp has been deliberately destroyed by fire. These events signify the end of the ritual and the young people's return to the village life. Initiates take uh, take the curved nose and phallic symbols from the mask and burn them with the camp ridge pole. The ashes will be used as a charm during the next Inkanda ritual. Four African combs. These are the Yakosuku area, Southwest Democratic Republic of Congo. Yep. The four fan-shaped combs have teeth of wood, which are separated and bound with dyed vegetable fiber, which also forms the striped waisted handle. Kofur throughout the whole of Africa has traditionally been a paramount importance for both men and women and their hairstyles that are worn, uh, worn to say much about their tribal affiliations and status. The dressings of the hair are also important in social activity as it is extremely time, uh, time consuming and requires social cooperation the hair has to be braided and decorated by another. Combs are used both to separate and organize the hair and are also worn as part of the uh, kofur. Now this panel was created as part of a boy's initiated, uh, initiation display structure. See the, the animal over there? You see what would be basically the the boy, and then the mask on the opposite side. Now, this is a high-ranking uh, Chokwe chief, 
Ndamba Timba from Angola in 1881, engraving from Capella and Ivans from Bengulu to the territory of Yaka. Now the Congolese Yaka Rafia feather bore tusk and wood mask. Told you they're pretty artistic. A vintage Congolese Yaka people ceremonial mask composed of woven raffia, painted wood, feathers, and bore tusk. The mask has a name composed of brown raffia fiber with a tightly woven back with uh, eye, eye holes. A beard made of brown, black, and beige feathers, raised eye opening, piercing the woven back and curved nose with a black and brick red horizontal arc below and a bore tusk protruding uh, from a woven open above the eye holes. You can't see it, the eye holes right here. That's the eye holes. And that's the tusk it comes from above. Now among the Yaka shamanists, which I hate this word, shamanistic divination is a highly sensory practice. One that focuses on the awakening of a power from within and on soliciting communal adherence to the power. It requires one to become awakened to an entire world that is alive, interacting open-ended and self-regulating. Yaka divination includes a belief that the ecstatic communication or exchange is possible between human spirits and the animated life world that reinforces connections of otherworldly and this worldly. The Yaka people are located in, again in the southwestern Congo and are part of the Bantu ethnocultural group. They trace their origins uh, uh, to the institution known as the Ngumbwa Wifwa, which is derived from one of the major cults of spirit possession and healing responsible for the Yaka mediumistic style of divination. They initiate the visionary contact with the spirits with a self-induced altered state of consciousness. It is common in rural areas that there is only one diviner for a population of 2,000 people. Yaka diviners play a large role in both rural and urban settings. In the city, people are more likely to visit with the diviner one-on-one -on -one as opposed to a family event. The materials used for divination are usually kept in a bag or a cup of some sort in order to get messages from the spirits about the misfortune or illness brought upon a person. These items include animal remains, birds, insects, shells, bones, and fur, among other things. Conclusion. The Yaka and his people endure the history no different than other African tribes who encountered the Portuguese. Where freedom that once existed became exhausted by spiritual and political influences that was introduced to them by foreigners. The culture and rich Yaka people fought for their existence despite any migration and due to that, we can appreciate the history of the people who are hardly talked about. You know my sources. You can pause it, capture it, revisit. History is a clock that people use to tell the political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells the people where they have been, what they have been, where they are, what they are. All right, man, so that actually conclude the presentation. Appreciate everybody tuning in today. Like I said, I won't go keep you very long. However, what I learned about the Yaka people is not only did they fight or resist colonial rule, they were able to maintain as much of their culture as possible, even with the influence of Christianity um, from two different waves. 
The first wave being the Portuguese, the second wave being being the uh, Leopold and his and his nuances and ignorance. You got to think th these are uh, traditions and cultures actually survived some really unstable times um, because they had inner war fightings going on. They had um, beef with the Portuguese. They had beef with uh, Belgian the Belgian people, Leopold now you know, and they were trying to still hold on to the things that they actually was able to hold on to. So what we see today is uh, reminiscent of what was there years ago before the, before they were introduced to the Portuguese. So, you know, I want to applaud the Yaka people for trying to hold tight or hold to some of the customs and traditions that originally were stood. There's still some places in pockets of Africa, I would say, that have not been touched by uh, these Abrahamic faiths and uh, watered the cultures down and able to hold on to those things. We haven't uncovered we haven't uncovered them, but some some we've actually have uncovered. But it, you know, for some kind of reason, you know, most people don't really just have those conversations. However, I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, be on the lookout. We have a book coming out uh, called uh, "It's in the Chat: Spears of the Masses," right? Uh, from Kofi Pice, our research team. Um, we're really excited about this, uh, um, this particular book. For one reason, because this is something that we did as a collective. Uh, Brother Kofi, uh, Sutep, Sutek, uh, T'Challa and Vasa, myself. Uh, you know, we all came together to put out a product that we hope everybody would embrace and enjoy. Um, when we put the pre-order link out, man, we'd be looking for y'all to go ahead and, you know, support, support the book. We put pen and paper. Uh, we did our thing. And, um, you know, we kind of already got the book together. We just got to go back and, you know, do what people do when they, when they putting the book out. So the book will be available next month around the 25th. Um, and, uh. I want to thank Brother Desar for the uh, the work he's actually been doing on the back end, trying to uh, help us out with some things that we've been trying to do as well. Uh, the relentless work ethics of uh, Kofi, you know, trying to make sure that, that, that we see this thing through. Um, and everybody else, especially Vasa, for his back end work that he's doing and uh, continue to has, to has to be done. Um, by taking the initiative and helping drive, you know, the, the other end of these things together. Uh, you know, the rest of the rest of the team who, who diligently is working and continue to work and shoot, we still got some work to do, but uh, the product will be out. The product will be out. The book is written. <laughs> it's written. It's written. I'll tell you that right now. The book is written. We're doing the little nuances, you know, the little things, uh, the nuts and bolts, the little fine tunings, you know, it's uh, making sure that, you know, the clear coat, that the paint job is right. It's what we're doing right now. We're making sure the paint job is right. Make sure we got the clear coat on there good. So it look wet when they come out, you know what I'm saying? When they come out the shop. So uh, again, man, I do want to, uh, I want to say, do I? Abby, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, look for volume one again, Spears of the Masi. The pre-order link will be coming soon. Um, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to rock out like that. Uh, what did it say? That the Yaka depend on divination more so than physical warfare. Um, as far as, the, remember, with divination for the Yaka, they went to the diviners only in critical times. So it would be if an illness came over, or uh, ill will, so uh, they were war. They were noticed that I said when they when they formed their kingdom um, with the people people that they were beefing with, because it was a different group of people that made up the Yaka. They uh, buried their weapons and made peace with one another. So they were going to war. Greenspear. Um, they were not consulting. Now, you may have the chief go and consult, uh, the chiefs go and consult, 
um, the diviners regarding responses of what they want to do. But uh, and realistically, these people were ready to go to war. Now, they didn't have the tools that other people had when they came in, like invaders had. They even had names for invaders. If you, you go back and look at the presentation, I give you the names of invaders. And um, they pointed and called them out. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's how they go. That's how they go. Uh, yeah, I think I kind of answered your question. As far as dealing with the diviners, as far as the, uh, the spiritual asset, a part of it too, you know, um, they didn't look in the sky for a solution. <laughs> they didn't look in the sky for a solution. They honored the spirits and the, and uh, they honored the spirits and the ancestors. Right? They hold religious uh, concepts, or uh, if you want to use the word religion, was about the spirits and the ancestors. It wasn't about the sky god, so to say. So I thought that was neat as well. But nah, they weren't um they weren't consulting divine as the to resolve their issues like that. And notice when I talked about what the diviners had, you know, when they would go see the divine, the diviners only had a bag with with certain items in it. Those items would dictate or tell them, you know, how they want to do. But remember, divine and their number map, you know, it's dealing with math. So um it is what it is with that. But yeah, in my study in the Yaka, you know, I've been sitting on this for a little while. I haven't even went back to edit or touch the presentation or anything like that. And I remember getting toward the end when I started seeing some uh, some things in the previous that uh, I used multiple sources at that time to corroborate how these people lived and what, what were some of their staple foods and things of that nature. So I wanted to bring to you a little bit of piece of their history, a little bit of piece of their culture, a little bit of piece of their traditions and uh, and fit that all in one. So uh, hopefully I was able to do that. Hopefully you learned something back. For those who missed the presentation and will watch it later, uh, hopefully you appreciate the, the research that went into actually putting this forward. Um, stay tuned the next time I, I go live, I will speak about uh resistance um i've been sitting on that for two months um you know i i could have did this presentation uh maybe what was it, a week or two ago i i did the other one responding to brother reggie but um that was more important at the time there was something else i wanted to talk about today because there's an emergence of ignorance that is happening right, be right before us, but I don't want to mess this video up. So I'm going to end on that note and I'm going to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, Shimon Hotel, remember, Spears of the Masi Volume 1 by Kofi Pasa Research Team coming soon. Real soon. Like 36 days soon. Like you got one month to get your mind right soon. Like when the pre-order link come out, jump on it soon like reserve your copy soon like support the book soon like we following in the footsteps of our ancestors we doing what we're supposed to do putting pen to paper so that you can critique us so that you can scrutinize us <laughs> Have a good evening.